empowered people make informed decisions that lead to living a life without regret. This is Sarah Kaki and Shauna Woods from Atlanta Divorce Law Group, and this is the Happily Ever After Divorce Podcast. All right, we're back with another episode of the Happily Ever After Divorce Podcast. I'm Sarah Kaki, and joined by our managing partner from Atlanta Divorce Law Group, Shauna. Hey, Shauna, how are you? I'm great, Sarah. How are you today? I'm good. I'm excited about this conversation because you and I talk about this off topic quite a bit. It's one of those things like define obscenity. I know it when I see it, right? Right. And that's what we're talking about, toxic relationships. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it, usually from the outside. But today we want to talk about how do you know you're in a toxic relationship when you're on the inside? Do you have a formula for how you know you're in a toxic relationship? I don't think there is a formula for how you know you're in a toxic relationship. I think there's a lot of times, like you said, you can see it from the outside or you can see it backwards looking in. Yes. But I think that one of the things that when people talk to me, you know, when when we have clients or potential clients that are coming in and they start talking about their relationship, a lot of times I'm just kind of reflecting back to them. So is this what you're telling me is going on? And once you start reflecting it back to them, they start recognizing for themselves oh, this isn't a healthy relationship. This isn't what I want to be in a healthy relationship. So as far as identifying it, I think talking to other people about what's going on, whether it's a marriage counselor, whether it's a really good friend, whether it's you know your, your family members who you depend on, and just talking through and saying, I'm feeling something mm-hmm. here. Trusting that feeling, you know. That gut. That gut that says... Something about this isn't right. Have you ever been in a toxic relationship? Oh, goodness. Or friendship? Absolutely. I, both. You know, I think when, and I've been very open, and you and I are very open about our, our childhood and, mm-hmm. and all of the different things that we've come through. And I think when you grow up in a very dysfunctional family like I did, you don't recognize toxic relationships at first because those are the only relationships right. you had. <laughs> Right. And the standard for what a healthy relationship is, is quite low. It really is. I've been in a couple of different co- uh, toxic romantic relationships, had some toxic friendships. And I think the key for me when I'm looking at it now mm-hmm. is do I like myself in this relationship? Yes. Yes. Yeah. If, if I'm not liking myself, then there's something wrong in this particular relationship. Like that is, um, it's so Shauna and I do not come to this podcast having discussed what we're going to say ahead of time, but that is literally what I had written down for myself is like, how am I showing up here? That does not surprise me whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but if there was to be a, an, an identifier, right. wouldn't that be one of the best ones? It really would. And, you know, do I like myself? Do I like what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Is this the person I want to be in this relationship? Because it does take an agreement to be in a toxic relationship. Unfortunately, yeah. So it takes one person to invite you into the toxic relationship and then for you to accept being in that toxic relationship. So it comes to so at that point, both people are being equally toxic if we're to be take sense of ownership ownership and accountability for it. Yeah. Because that's the only I mean, we'll have another episode where we can talk about how to get out of one, but it starts with recognizing and taking responsibility, doesn't it? It really does. And I think one of the things is that when you look at it and say, all right, they've done something that I don't like. Mm -hmm. Am I going to not say anything? Am I simply going to continue to accept that thing that I don't like? Right. Because that resentment, it it has to go somewhere. Right. You know, that feeling has to go somewhere and it's going to come out in a way that you probably don't want it to come out. You know, right in in a very toxic or equal energy back to that person. Now, I was also thinking that there are relationships I've had, friendships, where I've I've looked back and said, you know what, this person may or may not have been toxic, but something about them triggered something toxic within me, and I don't like the way I'm showing up here, and I don't like the role I am playing here. And that doesn't necessarily mean this is a toxic person, but for whatever reason, the yin and yang between me and this person turns in, turns something toxic on. 
And I think that has been very liberating where you stop chasing a box to put that person in, you know, oh, they're a narcissist or they have a personality disorder or, you know, they're just a selfish person or they're an asshole. Just if you let go of that and just say, you know, I may just be the asshole in this relationship and whether I want to, you know, go in and excavate what's showing up for me or not, maybe I can just say this relationship triggers something ugly in me that I don't like and I'm not mature enough or I'm not ready yet enough to be in this. And that's been very liberating for me to kind of look through my environment and say, you know, who sparks something in me that makes me want to be better, do better and give more and who puts me in an opposite seat. Sometimes it's intentional, I think, from the other side. And sometimes it may not be. It may not be. Absolutely. I find that for myself, if there is somebody who reminds me of my mom who had a really rough mm. relationship with, then I start acting in a very, um, I don't know if it's aggressive or very assertive right. manner towards them to set like very strong boundaries. And this poor person's just probably looking at me like, what's this person's problem? Right. You right. Know? So I have to recognize that within myself and either adjust so that I can have a good relationship yeah. with them or simply hold them at a distance knowing that this me is not able to have that relationship right. with that person. I'm not there yet. And that's okay. And that's perfect. And you okay. just, man, you, you just gave me something to think about. So again, Shauna and I aren't psychiatrists. We're not therapists. We're not psychologists. We're just <laughs> two women not in therapists. an area of law where we come across a lot of families and transitions and a lot of relationships being worked on. And we bring our own a history into it and to kind of help and analyze and give tools. But you just said something that gave me a lot to think about, which is perhaps when we're triggered by somebody that brings something toxic out of us, it's, and if it's unintentional from the other side, it might just be a reminder of something in our childhood or when we we're younger of somebody toxic. Absolutely. That we were dealing with. Like in your case, you were describing your mom. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it, it's one of those things where, you know, all relationships are meant to be forever relationships. There mm -hmm. are relationships that are meant to be momentarily. Right. Right. The spousal relationship, of course, is completely different when you choose a spouse that reminds you of something toxic. Maybe we need some therapy to pull all of that out, right? right. <laughs> you know, and deal with with those things. But it really could be nothing about these two people except for the combination thereof creates that toxicity. So you talked about the combination and there's a book and we've shared this book with a lot of our clients. It's called The Power of Ted and it talks about the empowerment triangle and the drama triangle. And basically... The book describes a triangle that is more or less a drum, drama triangle, a toxic relationship. And in this triangle, in one corner, you have a victim. In another corner, you have a rescuer. In another corner, you have the persecutor. And what's so brilliant about this is that each of these people are playing an equal part in this relationship. Every victim needs a persecutor so that they can stay a victim. But then they also need a rescuer to rescue them. Every rescuer needs a victim so that they can be rescue them and they also need a persecutor to make the victim into a victim so that they can go rescue it and so goes on for the persecutor needing a victim and at some point the book even describes that the victim might turn into a persecutor or might turn into a rescuer so these aren't even fixed positions but this is sort of what you and i are talking about where when you're in a relationship and you don't like or friendship and you don't like how you're showing up, you may actually find yourself where you're like, man, like this person just turns me into a persecutor. I, this person makes me feel like a bad guy, makes me actually bring out that ugly side of me. Or man, the rescuer is a really interesting one. And I see that a lot in family law, right? Mm -hmm. The one who says, oh, well, you know, I just wanted to help him. I wanted to do this or I wanted to help her or I... Well, it, did you want to keep them in that position, though? Did the marriage only work for as long as your spouse was a victim and you could keep rescuing them? Or did the marriage only work for as long as you were a victim and your spouse came in and rescued you? The moment you rose above that or your spouse rose above that, did the marriage lose its dynamic? And that I find to be sort of what we're talking about is like, am I showing up as one of these in this relationship? Is somebody inviting me to be their persecutor so that they can be a victim and I'm accepting that challenge? 
And there, you just hit the nail on the head on a lot of relationships. And sometimes it is uh, an original age difference where they've set up this dynamic mm. of the savior. Right. right. The, the, I call him the, the captain savior. That's their role, right? That's where they get their identity and that makes them feel good is I'm able to come in and rescue this person mm-hmm. and take care of this person. Well, what happens when that victim, the person they need to be rescued, no longer wants to be a victim. Right. Who wants to stand on their own two feet and say, no, I'm a whole person. I don't need you to rescue me anymore. Right. So the rescuer now feels devalued, right? They, they no longer have their role. That was their personality. That yeah. was their whole point in being in this relationship was to rescue. And so there's a lot of an identity crisis yes. that's going on between this person who wants to get out of being a victim and the person who doesn't want to stop being a rescuer. Yes. And I've actually seen that in friendships where a rescuer turns into the persecutor when the victim no longer, when their vic- the person who was playing the role of the victim says, you know, this role is no longer for me. Mm-hmm. And or they turn into the victim because then some they have to stay in that triangle. That's where they get their special from. And I think it's so important to identify these and recognize them because what we see a lot of times for uh, people in family law after their divorce, like, you know, he's just he was such a persecutor. He was so, you know, he was not kind to me. He was not taking care of me. I have seen this in so many instances, Shauna, with the women who were playing the victim role Mm -hmm. to a husband that was a narcissist and a lot of times legit a narcissist. The next marriage or the next relationship that they jump into is a complete 180 and they go find the rescuer. Yeah. Right. How, how common is this cliche? So much that it's a cliche. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Answered my own question. (laughs) It's rhetorical. (laughs) I, 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 Unfortunately, I think if people don't work through, through therapists to get, we're not, but through therapy, through self-exploration of who do I want to show up and be? Do I want to show up and be that equal? And I'm going to tell you, there's some women and some men, I'm not going to genderize this, but there are some people out there who they never want to stop playing victim. Yeah. That's their role, right? And in fact, if they are not allowed to play victim, They'll create a persecutor Mm -hmm. in some instances to say, oh, no, I must be the victim. That is the entire identity that I have. So I really do think that when you are transitioning, right, and we recognize these things, it's so good not, A, to jump from relationship to relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, stay alone for a while. Right. You know, um, as Julia Roberts said in one of her movies, you know, learn what kind of le- eggs you like to eat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was like the Pretty Woman sequel or something. Yeah. I love that movie. Runaway Bride. Runaway Bride. There we <laughs> That's go. That's what it was. drawing a blank. Yeah. So it's, but it's one of those things I think you really have to say, who do I want to be in this next relationship before you even have started? Right. One? Right. And I was looking at, um, I was Googling, of course. You know, signs for how you know you're in a toxic relationship before you and I jumped on. And it said, it listed things like envy, jealousy, disrespect, dishonesty, resentment, lack of support, um, controlling. You know, I kept thinking like, these are just symptoms. These, of course, symptoms, signs, same thing to lead to a diagnosis. But you can go from relationship to relationship at any point. You could have these, even in the best relationships, these signs and symptoms can show up from moment to moment because it's not to say that even the best relationships don't have their toxic moments even the best relationships don't have a moment where you are playing the victim card and your spouse has to come in as a rescuer and it might feel good for five minutes before you can move past it and say okay what's really going on but i think what we're saying which i find a lot more truth for me and in my heart and my marriage and in my friendships and relationships is how am I showing up? If there is envy or jealousy, how am I ag- coming to an agreement on that? If there is disrespect, how am I tolerating this? Why am I tolerating this? The power of TED book doesn't just give us the drama triangle. It also gives us the empowerment triangle of what does this triangle look like if it was a healthy, empowering relationship, mm-hmm. which I love. It actually, instead of the victim, it says, what if the victim was the creator? Meaning instead of just taking things as they come, being a um, 
life occurring to you. You're actually creating life. You're creating your reality. You're, you're an active participant mm -hmm. and a, an accountable participant in what's going on around you versus things just happening to you. The rescuer becomes the challenger. So instead of just saying, oh my God, I am so sorry, Shauna. I'm so sorry. All these terrible things happened to you. Poor you. Like, let me take care of all your pains. Like, Asking, well, Shauna, why do you think this is showing up for you? Like, ask a challenging question. Um, the persecutor becomes the coach. Instead of just pushing somebody down and keeping them sort of below you so that you can keep them in their place, what if instead you influenced them and gave them tools and gave them the resources so that they can rise above and empower themselves? Which I think is really, really cool. It's one of my favorite books that um, we typically give to our clients when they and the relationship so that they can go on to their next one in a healthier way. Do you think there's anything else here to say? I think that if you identify with any of these, the rescuer, and I want to tell you quite frankly, I identify with all of them at some point yeah, in my life. For sure. Um, and it's hard to say, yes, I've been the persecutor, but there are times when I'm Definitely have been. And I think that just recognizing that, looking at it and saying, what role am I playing here? Right. And how can we change this? Because it either you change the relationship or you move on from the relationship. Yes. Yes. And I think that I've definitely grew up being the rescuer. You know, oh, sure. and you, and I'm sure you have to <laughs> just with a lot of what we've dealt with as being um, children who yeah. very quickly matured to help with our parents and help with everything, life transitions our families had. I very much played the rescuer, but through a lot of personal development, I realized at my core, I'm a challenger. So it's really interesting to watch this and, you know, completely can empathize with having been the victim at some point. But I, it's, it's funny because today when I come across somebody that has victim mentality, I have to watch myself because I can turn into the persecutor. They trigger me. They trigger me really badly. And if it wasn't for a lot of self-awareness and work on myself, I had to realize like, oh, no, 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 no. Like I got to I don't like how I'm showing up. This isn't part of myself. I do not enjoy. This is not me being in a state of giving. Can I turn into a challenger and challenge the victim to become a creator? If so, great. Let's continue this and let's continue to give and help the, this person. If not, I, I got to walk away. And I think that's a really important point because, you know, recognizing that in yourself, I recognize that in myself sometimes, and sometimes I'm the rescuer, mm -hmm. depending on the role that, that I find myself in, but changing it, not always does that victim want to change, stop being exactly. a victim. And those are the times when you have to say, okay, I've done everything I'm going to mm -hmm. do and I'm going to walk away. And knowing that that person may still identify you as the persecutor because they still want to play that victim, that doesn't mean that's who you are. Absolutely. If they're, you're, they're, if they're identifying themselves as a victim and that kind of sits and feels good, you got to let them have it. You got to walk away. And some people, it's not, it's due to lack of awareness. And as a challenger, you can bring an awareness to it. But as a rescuer or persecutor, you're not. You're letting them go dig deeper into that role and you're giving more validity to that. And you're not being of any service to anybody. We will have another part to this where we're actually talking about, talk about how to get out of it, which Absolutely. will be fun today. We just kind of want to talk about how to identify it, which I think it's hysterical that we had the exact same thoughts. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Me neither. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Happily Ever After Divorce Podcast. If you'd like to learn more, go to atlantadivorcelawgroup.com forward slash resources.